Thorne Harkin, and you're at the Mid-Atlantic Air Museum. I'm kneeling in the bomb bay of the museum's TPM Avenger. If you haven't seen it already, I suggest you go ahead and watch the cockpit tour of this aircraft. But today, I'm going to go ahead and show you the outside of this aircraft and then the crew compartments. Let's start here in the bomb bay. The pilot was gracious enough to leave the bomb bay doors open. You're viewing the bomb bay from below the engine looking rearward. The aircraft is currently configured with four 500 pound high explosive bombs. Using these bomb shackles located on the sides of the bomb bay, we could configure this aircraft to drop a multitude of bombs consisting of 12 100 pound bombs, four 500 pound bombs like you see configured, two 1000 pound bombs, and even one 1600 or 2000 pound bomb. By reconfiguring with a couple slings and sway braces, we could install a torpedo much like this example. Using a bomb dolly like this, and winches located above the shackles, we could pick up the bombs or torpedo to load them into place. The bombs or torpedo were electrically or mechanically dropped by the pilot. If configured with a bombardier, which I'll discuss later, electrically was the only release method. The Avenger could even be configured to lay a smokescreen. Continuing with armament and ordnance, located on the wing racks are these 5 inch rockets. These unguided air to surface rockets were effective against shipping and also used for close air support. Located in each wing were these 50 caliber M2 forward firing machine guns. These were intended to harass and suppress any anti-aircraft gunners while making a torpedo run against a ship. Located here is the access panel. Here you have the ventral turret, or stinger. It was equipped with a 30 cal machine gun, used by the radio operator to protect the aircraft's lower rear, shown here. You'll notice attached to the barrel is a 16mm gun camera. These were used to help clarify if an enemy was shot down or not. You'll notice there are a handful of them on this aircraft. Here is the forward-looking camera. This would be used to see how effective the pilot's suppressing fire was. There is one more of these 16mm cameras I'll show you when we explore the turret. You're now looking at the underwing mounted torpedo camera. This camera was equipped with a wide-angle lens and used to evaluate the pilot's aim and release of a torpedo. Slung under the opposite wing is the radar pod. This APS-4 radar was used to track air-to-air -air or air-to-surface targets, like ships. Once inside, I'll show you where the scopes would be. As a Navy carrier-based aircraft, slow speed qualities were very important. A unique feature of the Avenger are these slats. Located at the leading edge of the wing, these slats increase lift and help maintain aileron authority while at high angles of attack. If you watch the cockpit tour, you may remember I discussed the inertia starter. I have attached the hand crank which is used to spin up the inertia starter. This can be used to save the battery, as the batteries used during World War II weren't as reliable as modern day. Let's talk wing unfolding. If the engine is not running, we can either pump the wings using the hydraulic hand pump located on the right side of the cockpit, or a handful of able bodies to push the wing into place. I'll disconnect these wing fold cables and then stow them in here. Once the wing is in place, I can use this stowable handle to actuate the wing locks. Here you can see me checking the oil. This is a good way to get over your fear of height. This will pretty much conclude our outside tour. You may have already surmised, but the Avenger consisted of a pilot, gunner, and radio operator bombardier. Let's go ahead and take a look at the crew stations. With the crew entrance door closed, you can see a fresh air vent at the top. In the event of having to bail out or ditch at sea, I can lift this lever to jettison the door. 
You are now viewing the inside crew compartment, specifically the radio operator station. I'll go ahead and put down the radio operator's seat. This can be easily folded and stowed for more room. As mentioned before, this aircraft could have had a radio operator that also acted as a bombardier. Taking a closer look, we'll start from the lower left. This box is an intervalometer, used to specify the intervals the bombs would be dropped. To the right of that box is the sending key, used by the radio man to send Morse code over the radio. Below that is a fire control panel that could be used to arm the bombs. Wired to the fire control box is a pistol grip looking bomb release. Continuing right, a few instruments used by the bombardier. Above that, a radio transmitter. Recessed and to the right of the transmitter is the ARB unit. You may remember the coffee grinder discussed in the cockpit tour. Finally, below that is a small inspection window to view the bomb bay. Here you can have a closer look at the transmitter. While being uncommon, a window and Norden bomb site could be placed in this location. Here's a closer view of the bombardier's equipment. Here's the view through the bomb bay inspection window. With the radio operator's seat folded up, we'll take a look at the stinger, or ventral turret. The 30 caliber machine gun will be fed by this magazine. Here you can see I'm lying down in position. Even with the tailwheel up and locked, out of the way, the visibility is still very limited. It was later deemed unnecessary and removed from subsequent models. With me lying down at the stinger position, you can see the stowed radio operator seat. This also gives you a reference at how much room there is back here. Just a note, if the radar scope was installed, it would be at that empty space to the right of the bulkhead shown here in the flight manual. Let's head upwards and check out the top turret. I'll release this armor plate so we can take a look. Here is the top turret seat. In the right of this photo, you can see one of the manual hand cranks used to move the turret without electric power. Housed in the turret is one 50 caliber M2 machine gun. I'll go ahead and climb up in here. Well, here I am. It's definitely a tight fit. And definitely designed for a small person. Once I lift my legs up, I can latch the armor plating below me, allowing me to train the turret wherever I want. I do that by using this hand controller. I put power to the turret by flipping this switch in the on position. I'm then free to move the gun up and down, or the turret left and right. The pistol grip contains three switches. The first is the action switch, number six in the figure. By depressing, with my middle, ring, and pinky fingers, I'm allowed to move the turret. If released, the turret will return to its current, stowed position. The second is the high speed switch number three in the figure, actuated by my thumb, which would allow me to change the rate at which the turret moves. Finally, the trigger switch, number five in the figure. Not installed, but shown on the diagram, is the manual trigger control to the left. Here you see the reflector gun sight and dimming switch. This is the view you would see if you were aiming down the gun sight at a target. The turret also has a backup ring and bead sight. Located above the barrel of the machine gun is the 16mm gun camera. In the event of an emergency and having to egress the turret, I can spin this handle and push the window out. Alright, I slipped down and out of the turret, so let's go ahead and move forward. You're now looking at the rear cockpit. It's currently configured for an observer. More commonly placed here was the autopilot control 
hydraulic autopilot servos, and radio equipment. Here you can see I have opened up the access canopy. Located aft of the observer seat and forward of the top turret is a light wrap compartment. I'll now head on aft and exit through the crew door. We can still carry on coming in on a wing and a friend. Before I finish, I want to show you a couple other features. You'll notice on most Navy aircraft of World War II, these blue lights, these are called formation lights. Turned on and used at night, these lights aid the wingman in keeping in position at night. There's a light on the top of each wing and one aft towards the tail. Located on the left wing is the approach light. Depending on the angle viewed, this light and filter would be illuminated green, amber, or red. This was used by the landing signal officer to aid in guiding the aircraft on a specific glide slope to catch the arresting wire with its arresting hook. You can see I'm demonstrating how the approach light would work on this Eastern Aircraft FM2 Wildcat. We hope you enjoyed the rest of your tour of the museum's TBM Avenger. You can visit this aircraft and many others like it at the Mid-Atlantic Air Museum. And don't forget, you can go ahead and book it for your air show. Until next time, we'll see you around the pattern.